I'm going to start my reading vlog slash book talk for A Court of Wings and Ruin. So this is part of my ongoing series. I've done a book talk for Akotar and Akko Math on my channel already as well. So I will link those down below in the description. And our live show is tomorrow. And I started this book last night, read 30 pages and fell asleep. And then today I only got up to page 100. <laughs> so I'm going to be stopping every 100 pages to do a talk on what has happened so far in those 100 pages. So it is like pretty thorough and we will be discussing pretty thoroughly in the live show tomorrow. However, I really feel like I can do this because this book is just flying by. And the thing with Alchemath is I remembered it really well. So I didn't feel the need to read it as fast. But like with this one, I barely remember anything that happened. So I'm really intrigued by all of this stuff. So let's just head on into the beginning. So we start with a flashback scene from Reese in the war. And just like that he was sacrificing and like doing all this stuff. Okay, so now we have Feyre in the Spring Court. I actually love reading about Feyre in the Spring Court because she is there and she is pissed and she is emotionally manipulating the heck out of everyone to achieve her goals, which is to win the war. And I mean, like if I was Feyre, I'd be pissed too. Like I am turned her sisters into Fey. She like captured them and captured them in Fey, even though like the sisters didn't want to be Fey. You know, they, they sold out to Highburg basically. So, you know, she's a little pissed. And also Tamlin is an abusive asshole. We already know that. And it just it just got worse by the end of the map. So it starts off with this quote where Feyre is basically talking about how she's like painting this like bright, pretty, like floral landscape and how the painting is a lie. And that kind of also reflects what she's doing there now. Like she's living this lie and like pretending to be someone else, pretending that she was like coerced mentally by like Reese's powers into being his his mate and acting the way that she was. And so that's kind of like an illusion. So she's just chilling in the spring court and then things start to get interesting when Ianth shows up and she's already trying to worm her way into Tamlin's good graces again for power. And she's honestly just such a snake, I hate her. So then Jurian and the prince and princess of Highburn show up and that's where the manipulation really starts to go down. Something I'd like to note is that Lucian is very wary of Feyre during this time period. We kind of see that he doesn't really believe the show that she's putting on. So anyway, so like Feyre's kind of just like baiting people to work the situation to her advantage. Like, however, like Jurian and Feyre go at it and then Feyre kind of uses the defense of our home. And then so like Tamlin will like came and like brushed a finger along her cheek and like a, an affection because she had baited Jurian into giving her the opportunity to like use that kind of word, words and then so like he feels like he can trust Feyre and it's so interesting because Tamlin is so blind, blinded by like this, I wouldn't even say like love for Feyre but like by this need to possess her that he is completely underestimating her. And then we also find out that Dag Dagden and Braneg I'm probably completely butchering his names. Those are the hybrid prince and princess. They are also De Demot Dematai. Um, so they also have like those mental powers and so they kind of have like this mental battle um, going on. And Dan, okay. So then they go and like they check out the wall and like they're surveying all the different holes in the wall to see like the basically the best place to bring the armies through. Some, an interesting point is that Lucian talks about how on the day that Farah left, he saw the melted down ring and removed it before Tamlin could see it, which I think is like significant. And I, because it circles back to something else later. Um, and then he basically says this thing that, um, you are a better friend to me, Farah, than I ever was to you. And I also talked about Ianth and how Tamlin decided that he wasn't going to participate in the rite because then basically you'd have to have sex with Ianth and or is it Ianth or Ianthi? I don't know. And so then that basically mean that like Lucian had to participate in his place and Farrah talked about how that's like a very blurred line of consent because Lucian was kind of like forced into the situation by Tamlin so like he was willing to have sex with Ianth in that context but also not really so it is kind of like a very gray area of consent. Um, and again that's because of then there's this really interesting exchange between Alice and Feyre where 
Alice is basically kind of like shows fair in night court clothes and like you should wear these and basically like Alice is kind of just saying like I don't care what you do just like don't hurt me or my boys and it's clear that Alice like has faith in Feyre and like believe in her and that she had seemed happier when she had come back okay I'm back sorry I cut out so abruptly last time but my dog was just being insane so it's now <laughs> much later and I've read up to two pages to page 200 so i'm going to talk through the first 200 pages of the book and i think i stopped around page 40. i honestly forgot what i was talking about last time well, let's just see where it was okay here we are so here we're talking about this quote that i underlined is that everyone had seen my suffering and done nothing to help me basically being like everyone that was around Feyre and tamlin when she was there after under the mountain basically became complacent and like had a hand in her suffering because they saw that stuff was wrong with her and like did nothing to help like alice and lucian and then we have the solstice ceremony which it i just think is so cool because like Feyre worked with ianth to like go through the ceremony and then she used her powers of like wind to just like shift the her like spot that was marked on the ground with a stone to show where she was supposed to stand so like she could raise her arms and the sun would come through and then instead like the sun shone on Feyre as it was rising and then like Lucian was standing next to her so that he was kneeling next to her and then she used like her power of like glowing to glow during the ceremony so basically like a symbolic way to undermine Ianth and also the fact that Lucian is next to her kind of turns things around and then like they have the festival and Vera's being like slowly flirty with Tamlin so then she like knows that Tamlin's going to try and come to her room that night so she puts on like this scanty little nightgown and pretends to have a nightmare and then goes to Lucian for comfort and then Tamlin walks in on her and Lucian entwined and so basically like turning Tamlin and Lucian against one another to undermine them in that aspect as well and then one of my favorite things that she said here is that like a nightmare I told Tamlin I was the nightmare because she literally is wrecking havoc on the night court and so then they're talking about Feyre and Lucian are talking about like the deal with Highburn and talking about like how bargains are like just a really old magic and like how like the cost could be your life or like something equally as powerful and then something interesting that i pointed out is that lucine said we we're back into a corner with no options none it was either go to war with the night court and highburn or ally with highburn let them try to stir up trouble and then use that alliance to our own advantage further down the road and so they was like what do you mean because that he like kind of let some information slip there then the children of the blessed come and they like are like oh we want to go to the fey lands to like you know do whatever and Feyre uses her mind powers to send them back to the human side of the wall but then the highburn prince and princess hunt them down and kill them which is very sad so then jurian and Feyre have this conversation and Jurian talks about how Reese like sacrificed himself on the battlefield or sacrificed his troops on the battlefield to like save Miriam um, and that Reese is not like a bad person like that and he knows that personally and like it's suspicious that the most powerful High Lord has lost his mate and has not come looking for her which great that's a little suspicious so Jurian is definitely a little suspicious of Feyre and then so when they found out that the Highburn people went after the Children of the Blessed, Lucian and Feyre sent the Bog after them which I love um, and then this kind of incites an argument between Feyre and Tamlin and then this is a part that I thought was just really significant is that Tamlin exploded in power again and Feyre didn't shield herself so she basically let herself be harmed in a way to undermine Tamlin to show that he's like actually abusive and when you like think about the fact that she like let herself be hurt like that it's just like absolutely insane so then like everyone sees that basically like Tamlin hurt Feyre like she had bruises all over her face and her arms and all that and like she 
make sure her healing powers weren't working so that she like was really really injured um and then of course like tamlin is shaking and like begging for forgiveness blah blah, blah and like Farah pretends to forgive him um to kind of like make a show of it so it's just so it's so interesting the way that she like goaded tamlin into being like his worst self and it kind of like showed oh, that he like really is an abusive asshole um and then tamlin begs for forgiveness and of course Farah playing like the the role that she's playing like decides to forgive him for now um and then there's this whole scene where Farah basically sets up to undermine tamlin's court where Ianth as revenge on Feyre for like stealing her thunder during the ceremony um, was talking about how the Naga were all of a sudden like a problem and then stole keys from a sentry to send the Naga in to the Spring Court and attack them so that she could then like be the savior. Um, and then so then the sentries who like keys were missing like, got brought forth and then Feyre basically like showed him the memory that she had of Ianth stealing the keys which she did to to stage that attack um and then it's like a play like tamlin like tamlin like whether or not to harm the guards based on what they said by that was like a play between Feyre and ianth for power where Feyre was like let's listen to him and ianth was like no like are you gonna listen to him over like your high priestess blah 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 and what Ianth doesn't know is that Farah knows that Tamlin will listen to Ianth and that is part of her plan and that basically like gets all of the centuries like really mad at Tamlin and against him because she had talked about like how all of these centuries had died for him like had gone to the human realms to basically sacrifice themselves um and his thanks was to like basically do that okay so then they go to the wall again and she kind of learns like their purpose for being there and so she had what she needed and so she was gonna leave but then she sees ianth coming on to lucian where he she has him like handcuffed so that he can't use his powers with that special stone and is being the predator essentially and so Farah is like okay i have to do something and so she like makes her hit her own hand as much as possible and like breaks it crumples it and then tells her that she's like never going to like touch another man again against his will and all that stuff and then she was like i wanted to slit your throat and i was like damn girl um but that hopefully this is a better punishment and then, like, at the end of that, then the hybrid generals come in, and so basically now all chaos is breaking loose where Farrah thought she was going to slip away. And they have, they basically, I think that, and then they, Farrah killed them, and then Lucian is like, take me with you to the night court. I want to see my mate, Elaine. And she's like, all right, I guess so. Um, and, oh, and then another fact that we got during this exchange is that they had been slowly poisoning Feyre and everyone in the court with Sabine powder mixed into the food enough to like knock out their powers but not so much that like they could completely notice so like the powers were kind of muffled and then they gave her like an apple that morning that had like a big dose so she couldn't use any of her powers so then they're escaping and they go into the night court the autumn court and they think they're clear of it and then they run in to Eris and the other brothers from the autumn court and they have a fight and like just when it looks like they're gonna take them and you know kill them more and Cassian and Asriel come so like uh, after like they go through all the lands and stuff like that they so they have an encounter with the brothers and then they escape um, and then Feyre and Lucien are talking and Lucien's like, you left us. So like, Lucien kind of feels abandoned by Feyre, but Feyre was like, you abandoned me ever before I abandoned you. Like, you ignored my like emotional breakdown essentially. Um, so like their relationship is so interesting because it's very like back and forth where it's like they are friends and they obviously care for one another, but they're not like, Lucien's not like a great friend to her, but he's not a bad person per se so it's just really interesting to see okay so then they're running across this frozen lake in the winter court and eris and them show up and they have fire so they have it out and then cassian and Azrael come to the rescue and Feyre declares herself high lady of the night court which okay so then they go back to volaris and there is 
a reuniting scene between Reese and Fabra, which is just so sweet. And, you know, I love them together. Then, of course, we have a little spicy spice scene. And Fabra just talking about how, like, this is her home and stuff like that. And then we get to where Nesta and Elaine are. And basically, Cassie and Nesta have been fighting the whole time. And Lucian wants to see Elaine. Um, let's see. So, Nesta could literally be like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm a fae now. Like, I didn't have any kind of, like, ties back in the human world. But Elaine is just, like, completely depressed and broken down because she was going to marry this guy that, like, was a fae hater and all this stuff. And, um, I just think it's interesting how I think a Cassian at one point says that, like, I understand why Nessa acts the way that she does because it, it was something done to her body against her consent. And I think that's kind of, like, a good way to think about it. It'd be like, why would you be mad if you were, like, turned into an immortal fae with all these cool things? And it's like, well, they didn't really have any kind of say in the matter. So I think that's important to talk about as well. Oh, and then something else that happens is that Lucine says, I hadn't realized that you were a villain. But I hadn't realized that I was a villain in your narrative, and then Fair says you weren't, not entirely. So that again points to Lucian and Fair's relationship where Lucian kind of just doesn't realize the things that he does that actually harm and hurt Fair. So anyways, I love the bit. I really feel like this is the book where we get a lot more of the inner circle's personalities and kind of, I think, sets the stage for what the next books are going to be because there's so much bickering between Cass and Cassian and Nesta and the tension is just so primed to explode. Um, I just really think they obviously have some sort of connection. Um, and there definitely is foreshadowing to Nesta having some sort of like dark power because it's talking about like when Nesta opened her eyes after the cauldron, like Feyre had seen some sort of power in her, but they don't know what it is. Um, Oh, and then there's this quote it says when I looked ahead I found Cassian staring back at Nessa as well I wondered why no one had yet mentioned what now shown in Cassian eyes as he gazed at my sister the sorrow and the longing Like I totally think that they're mates, but neither one of them is acknowledging it that there's like some sort of bond between them So when they first seen Elaine Fair was talking about how like Elaine had always been gentle and sweet and now to see that like she literally was not full of like light anymore it, ugh, It's just it's just so sad. Okay, so then they're planning for the war Some war stuff and They're planning this they're pitting the um, Continent fake courts against one another so that they don't interfere in there like, you know Creating chaos that way and then they're gonna call a meeting with all the high lords to discuss the war with Highburn. And then Fair's like, why do you bother with Nesta? And Cassian's like, I can't stay away. So then they have this family dinner and Nesta comes and it's just so interesting to see her interact with the rest of the inner circle. And then Amran is like, you and I are similar. And it's like, and then Nesta agrees to train with Amran on like whatever powers, which are very big, which are very vague at this point. She has um, in order to, to potentially be able to repair the hole in the wall since she is of the cauldron and the walls from the cauldron. And then Azrael agrees to teach Feyre how to fly because he learned to fly later than everyone else because he was basically like locked in a basement and tortured as a child. Which And then Reese and Feyre have this very touching conversation where Feyre is like, I snapped at you, like I didn't mean to undermine you. And Reese is like, well, we were with our family, like it's fine. And then they kind of like discuss the terms of their relationship, which I just think is very like important, not only as like a couple, but because they're like a power figure couple. And Reese is like, you're my equal. And then again, this quote uh, talk when Feyre is talking to Reese about Lucien, he's not a bad person, he's not evil. I just, there's risk in trusting him with a question, which again, just kind of like talks about that like interesting nature with Lucian and the fact that like his animal figure is, or and that's what he's called is the clever fox because he does kind of have that like emotional manipulation even if he doesn't have bad intentions. Okay, and that's where I am right now. It's 1 a.m. So this live show tomorrow's at six. I'm obviously, I'm not giving up yet because if I go to sleep now and I sleep late, then I won't finish in time tomorrow. But like, it's really interesting to read this, be reading this book again. I love seeing all the interactions between the inner circle, which is really what I feel like is the draw of this book. Um, and so I have page 350, I don't know if you can see, marked off on top. I'm gonna see 
if I can get to that before I pass out. So I'll probably do one more check-in tonight when I reach page 300. And then I'll read 50 more pages and go to bed. And then I feel like being at a solid 50%, I'll be able to wake up in the morning and then just read all day and be good for the live show. So, hello. So, <clears throat> I completely slept in way too late today. I just got ready for the live show. Um, but there is approximately zero chance that I'm going to finish this book by 6 p.m. when the live show is. So, I'm just going to read as much as I can. Until then, I have my coffee to keep me motivated. But let's talk about up to page... 300. I mean, again, I've read this book before, so like, at least I kind of know something of what's going on. My face is ready for the live show, even if my brain isn't. But I do even, I said this last time too, even if I don't finish it before the live show, which is physically impossible at this point, I do want to finish the book tonight. So I'm going to do that. I, I need to hold myself to that because <sighs> if I don't I'm, and I like keep going for like three weeks after, which I did with Aquamath, I'll be mad at myself, but I do find that I find this book very immersive because I forgot a lot of it and it really has a lot to do with the inner circle dynamics. So let's start on page 200 where we left off. Okay. So we have Cassian and Feyre are training and Cassian is mad at Feyre because he's like, as a high lady, like you're not just Reese's to protect, like you're all of ours to protect. Um, and so like the fact that she had sacrificed herself or like thought that she wasn't essential. Um, and then there's a lot of really funny banter between Cassian and Nesta. So so Cassian asks Nesta like scared and she's like, why should I be scared of an oversized bat who likes to throw temper tantrums? Which I just think is hilarious. So there's so much banter between them. It makes me so excited for A Court of Silver Flames. And then Asriel is teaching Feyre how to fly. And that's like really funny because we get to see more of Asriel because up until this point, he's just been a really quiet figure. And then they go to the library and we learn that this library is kind of like a sanctuary that Reese has created for women that are kind of like escaping from bad situations that have been harmed in some way. Um, and then there's this something mysterious at the bottom of like the pit in the library because the library kind of like swirls down and down. And reading about a library made me want to pick up Sorcery Thor of Thorns again. I just, I was like, what if I read Sorcery of Thorns again? So they're flirting in the library while they're also looking for information on like spells and stuff. Pharaoh's like, okay, well if we're like pretty hopeless with an army, why don't we like bring in the monsters? So they decide that they want to go get the bone carver and see if he will be on their side in the upcoming war. And they also have to go under, um, into the Hewn City to convince, and they also have to go into the Hewn City to try and convince Kier to give them their forces during the war. And then there's also some foreshadowing, I think, where Reese is like, remember who you put in here, Ca remember who you put in here, Cassian, and then Cassian, when Fair asks, Cassie is like best left for another time. So I wonder if that will come into play in Court of Silver Flames. Like I didn't realize this, but reading um, in the back of the book, like I, there were, or this author letter rather, in the front of the book, like she had already at this point when she published this book, had said that there are more books coming in this world. So I think that she had already been planning for like the Cassie and Nesta book at the point when this book was written. Um, sense to me. Um, which is why like all of these things are being built up and I do remember feeling like at the end of this book It wasn't completely resolved. Okay, so then they go to the bone carver and Farah realizes that the bone carver is showing her What her son with Reese would look like and then they're talking about Nesta and sh they're she's talking about like um, How like they trembled when she emerged she took something something precious She ripped it out with her teeth and that's like Nesta taking something from the cauldron um, and then the bone carver says, what did she do? Drowning in the ages dark, what did she take? And so then the bone carver is telling them about like the, the weaver, her name is Shriga, and she is a death god, as well as his brother Kosh, Kosh, Koshke, um, confined and bound in this little lake on the continent, which I think has to do with the firebird that comes in at the end of this. Um, and then he's also talking about like a fey warrior that had bound them in their, where they are now, and that to me made me feel like maybe there was some sort of connection to another Sarah J. Mask world. And then the bone carver basically said that he decided he wanted to be in this prison to hide from his siblings, so he's there. And then he's like, all right, I'll help you in the war if you get me the Ouroboros. And the Ouroboros is in the Hume City. And then Elaine comes down and she's speaking in riddles and everyone is like, okay, what's going on with this child? And the she keeps talking about like this bird of fire, which comes back into play later. And then Vera slips into Lucian's mind to make sure that Lucien has good intentions towards Elaine and she's like, did I cross a barrier? 
blah 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 and then there's just like this really sweet moment between elaine and azrael where azrael's like can i show you the garden and they just sit in the garden together and and then they're talking about like the cauldron and not nesta's like i made it give me something back so it's like what power does nesta have and i think they think that she's some sort of like death power Okay, so then they go to the Hewn City and it's basically like a big old shit show because Eris shows up because Eris found Azrael in their territory and so they kind of had to make a deal and basically Eris is like, I will support you in this war and get my father there if you like support my claim for the throne and then he kind of also like insinuates that there's more to the situation than had happened than just from what they had seen from their perspective the whole situation with more and obviously more is really upset because we just gonna offer the people in the human city to come into valoris so there's a whole whole bunch of that stuff going on so it's so interesting because a lot of these characters just like skim in that gray line and i'm interested to see more of eris's story to see if it's like justified because i don't remember and then so like Elaine has more visions and she like saying, I saw young hands wither with age, I saw a box of black stone, I saw a feather of fire land on snow and melted, which we know comes into play at the end of this book. And then I got to this point where now she's training with Cassian and she talks about how Cassian is actually really emotionally intelligent and people don't give him enough credit for that. And I was like, and that's where I'm up to at page 300. So let's hope I get to page 400 before the live show. And then I'll have 300 more pages to read tonight. I think that's like an attainable goal. I don't want to be too uh, too ambitious here either. <laughs> so that's it for now. Okay, so hello. It's the next day after the live show. And I have a nice glass of wine. My engraved wine glasses that Maddie got me. And I'm here to talk about the next 200 pages of... Aquawar. Okay, honestly, look at all these tags. I have been loving the heck out of this book. Like, it is just so good. So I'm gonna talk about page 300 to 500 now, and then I'm just gonna do one more check-in. I'm gonna probably finish this tonight and then do another check-in tomorrow about page 500 to 700, but I definitely am probably going to finish this today because I'm addicted. One thing that I will say is that this book is definitely better the second read because i feel like i'm less focused on the romance and more focused on like the other characters and learning their stories which is a big focus of this book whereas like the first time i was like i need figure and reese everything okay so we start here and more and Feyre are sitting with lucian and elaine where lucian is trying to feel and then lucian tugs on the bond and like elaine just feels like very unsettled and then Elaine says twin ravens are coming, one white and one black, which comes back to another thing. And another thing that I picked up is that Pharaoh talks about Lucien's skin and says that his skin was darker, a deep golden brown compared to the paleness of Eris's coloring, which is again another important thing that comes back later. And then I really liked the story that Azrael told Pharaoh when he's teaching her how to fly about the feel and how she was able to fly miriam out even though she was like always underestimated because of her small like wing size so i thought that, that was cool okay and then elaine is doing more vision talk and then uh, and then there's this moment between Feyre and nesta that says why do you always push everyone away but elaine and then nesta was starting to explain and then they got cut off because the ravens came into the library to attack them and i just want to take this moment to talk about nesta and how i've been actually seeing some like tiktoks or hot takes on the fact that people think that nesta is favorite abuser and like i don't know i and they think that nesta is like irredeemable because of that but like i really don't agree because Nesta was also a child of their father who was the abuser via negligence because he neglected his children forcing Feyre to go out and hunt and the way that Nesta dealt with that negligence is by doing nothing to try and see what it would take for their father to actually take care of them. So obviously you can see that they both handled the trauma in different ways but they're both victims of their father's negligence if that makes sense and obviously Nesta doesn't treat Feyre the best and like she's not like i'm not excusing that but like i just think it's taking it a step too far to say she's fair as abuser because um she's a bitch but like i don't know so like i totally think that her character is like obviously worth redeem re redemption and it's interesting that people don't say the same thing about elaine 
because then Elaine also sat on her butt, but because she's not like a mean person, people aren't saying that she's irredeemable. So it's just because Nesta is like a, a difficult woman that people say that she's irredeemable, but like the fact of the matter is, is that her being a, having a difficult personality and her like also being a victim of abuse, like it's two, two different things. Because if that's the case, then Nesta and es Elaine are both equally guilty, but they're not treated with that same vilification in the discourse over this book. So that's my two cents. So the twin ravens from Highburn come and that is what Elaine's vision was referring to. And they want Nesta because she took some of the cauldron's power. So basically she'd stolen too much of it. So they want her back. And then they go into the pit of the library and there they encounter the monster that lurks within that's apparently like terrible. Um, but then also like, so while they're running towards that monster, the ravens are basically like taunting them and they're talking about like the things that happened with the mortal queens and it basically like Elaine's visions are basically like what were about the mortal queens. Fair puts that together. Um, okay, so then Feyre makes this bargain with the monster in the library and basically they're going to send him company in order for her to, for it to help them escape from Highburn. And then Cassian and Reese come. And so anyways, so then Cassian gets them out and Reese finishes off the ravens after um, the monster is done with them. Oh, and then I love this where like Reese shows Pharaoh what Cassian showed him about the attack. Nesta through Cassian's eyes and like they're totally, is a mating bond between them. Like you can't convince me of anything different because he is just like so protective and like the tension between them is just so fantastic because they literally like are at each other's throats and it's amazing and then okay the other couple that i shipped is elaine and Azriel, and like i know it's like kind of cliche to ship like the three sisters with the three illyrians but i don't care because i love them um but the thing that like gets me in the feels is that Azriel was the one to figure out that Elaine is. And then it's like, once everyone kind of figures out that that's what she's dealing with, it's like, it, like it, she kind of comes back to herself a little bit because she realizes like what she's been dealing with. And then there they talk about Vasa who, um, and she is a firebird by day, human by night. And if we go back to the Bone Carvers chapter, that is his brother, one of the other death gods, a Ko Koshke or something like that. So I definitely think that that's going to play into like Silver Flames or like, and then oh, the thing that gets me is Reese and Pharaoh are talking and Reese is talking about how the library was a safe haven for the priestesses and also for him and how like Highburn hit him where he was like the most sensitive and they did that as like a personal attack. And then like this library was the only safe space for those women and now they have to work to rebuild that because Highburn took it away from them. And, it was just, like, and then we got the Highburn attack on the summer court, which is their first grand move. And basically Varian sends word to Amren and the inner circle goes to help. And we see Feyre and Moor in battle, which one of the things about this book is people talk about how Feyre doesn't fight, but she fights in this one. I mean, towards the end, I do kind of remember she wasn't fighting as much, but, and then Feyre gets stuck in Reese's mind. So that's basically like a clever way for us to see Reese's perspective when he faces the King of Highburn and he was like, gonna maybe kill him, but then he was an illusion. It was just a spell. Okay. And so then they go to see Tarkin and then Tarkin doesn't kill them on sight, but he's like still really pissed at them. And then Tarkin is like, you should like, sh Farrah shouldn't be giving High Lord's orders. And then Reese is like, she's highly leading in the like, court. She may do as she wishes. And I was like, damn, we love that. Oh, so good, okay. <laughs> and then they move the meeting. <laughs> So they move the meeting further and they decide to come as they are, like as their real selves. Ugh. And then after that like whole battle, Nessa's like, where is he? And then she said, Cassie, they clearly care about one another. Ah! Then they go back to the bone carver and basically they're like, can you do it for anything else other than the Ouroboros? And he's like, no. So then they come back and Elaine is baking with Luala and Saradwin and this is like the first time that they see her like feel any sort of positive emotion so that shows that she's healing okay and then oh and then they talk about like fair picks out a crown and then they look all hot to go to this meeting and then nessa says that she wants to come to the meeting she doesn't want to be remembered as a coward and i love that Ugh, and then they're 
Cassian and Nessa's exchange after that. There's so much Nessian in this book, I forgot how much, but. So then there's like this meeting and it's like so super tense. And this was around the 400 page mark and I literally couldn't put the book down. So I was like, I have to throw out. And then we see Vivian who is Kaliasa's um, consort in the winter court. And she's like, I wanna be a high lady too. So I hope that we get to see that in future books because I feel like there needs to be more highly case. Um, okay, let me see Lucien's mother, which is important, and Tamlin. Tamlin appears to the meeting and he's, I literally hate him. He is literally like making lewd comments at Feyre and being like a huge asshole, but then he's offering them information. So they're like, I guess they can trust him. Okay, so then there's like this whole meeting, it's super tense. And then they kind of like, come to an agreement, but Baron like leaves after he finds out that Feyre has part of his powers. And then the Dawn Court has also come up with an antibody to the Feybanes. Okay, let's see what else. And then Reese goes, I made her high lady because I love her. Okay, so then they all decide that they're going to fight together except for Baron who leaves. Okay, and then so they see Kilian after the fact, and he's like trying to have a foursome with more Azriel and Cassian. <laughs> but then him and more sleep together, but obviously more like doesn't seem happy about it the next day. Oh, but first of all, Pharaoh comes to a very important realization after Kilian basically says that he had an affair with Lucian's mother and that Kilian is Lucian's father, and that's where the darker skin comes into play. Um and he has the gift of fire because like his mother had like a strong gift of fire so that's how he inherited it. So that's something gonna come to play in future books. Oh, and then there's like a thing and it says, Bree says, Cassian's going up to decide some things too in the near future I think. Ferris says, oh he and Nesta. And Bree says, I don't know until the bond stops in the place. And the did it. Hamlin is being mean and then he's basically like, well, Farrah destroyed my court, so like I can't rally my army because she made them lose faith in me. And Farrah's like, well, I didn't think long term on this, but honestly, Tamlin still deserved it, so. Okay, so then Nessa gets really sick and basically she's like, the wall is gone, which is a big bad thing to happen. So basically like they were too late, they were too slow. So now they go to the Illyrian camp to rally the forces and then they are also, um, Feyre makes another bargain with Braxis, the guy in the lib the monster in the library, and basically like he just wants like a, a skylight so he can see the moon and whatnot. Okay. So then they go to rally the Illyrian troops and then Elaine's like, let's go to the human lands and we can convince Grayson to which is her former fiance, to let the humans have refuge. Okay, Gavin, two minutes. Oh, and then there's this like moment when they're waiting in the guardhouse of Grayson's like estate that Ferris says sometimes I have problems with small spaces and Nessa's like, I can't take a bath. And it's like, they share their trauma and it's like, Ooh. Okay, so then Jurian comes in and he's like, I warned them that they need to let humans in. And basically Jurian is like, I was on your side. Like Reese, why didn't you look into my mind? Like I want to apologize to Mirian and Drakum. And then all of a sudden it's like, Jurian is not the enemy. But then, and this is right where I stopped. The wall came down and Tamlin ran right back to Highburn after the meeting with the High Lords. And this was my animation on that page. Let's see if you can see it. I literally, he's the worst. He's literally the worst. I i really hope he doesn't get into redemption arc because he's the worst. Anyways, that is all for now. And then I will check in once I finish the book. Okay, so I finished the last 100 pages of Echo War. And as you can see, my shelves are finally set up behind me. I did just post my setting up my new shelves video, so check that out on my channel. So let's talk about the last 100 pages, which were so freaking intense. I mean, look at all of these tabs. I definitely have such a deeper appreciation of this book the second time around, just because of like how intense everything was, all the interactions we got between the different characters. It definitely was less focused on the love story, but I feel like the second time around, that was like the first time around I was just like I need recent fair everything but the second time around like I really have just a deeper appreciation for the other characters so let's start on page wait did I talk about page 500 okay I think I need to talk about the last 200 pages sorry okay so yeah because the last time I talked about was 
Nesta like slapped Grayson. Is that where I am? Okay, so we find out that Jurian is not evil. He's on their side because he wants to apologize. Okay, and then they go to battle with Hybern. The first battle with Hybern, Jurian gave him the correct information and it's just battle and it's crazy. And then Nesta sees that Cassian is hurt and she's like, there's so many Cassie and Nesta moments, so many Elaine and Azrael moments that I just like picked up on every one because I was like, I need them together. All right, so then Farrah goes to hunt down the Surreal so that they can find the location of the army. Um, like the, not the fake army, but the true army. So she hunts the Surreal um, by Elaine scrying and the Surreal's in the middle and the scene just like gets me. So the Suriel basically tells her that they can use Nesta to track the cauldron and that they need to die for them to stop the cauldron and then only Feyre can decide what breaks her um, and then gives her the answer to like where the spell is in the spell book. And then Ayanth shows up and kills the Suriel and I hate that bitch. I hate her. <sighs> so anyway, so they knew that Feyre would probably go for the Surreal again, so Ianth like put a spell on the Surreal's co coat that she gave it. Um, and then so Feyre lures her into the Weaver's cottage and Ianth gets eaten by the Weaver, which is beautiful. And then she goes back to the Surreal and the Surreal just asks that she stays until the end. And then says that Pharaoh was kind to him and fought her fears and it said thank you for helping me when no one else would Ugh. and then it says stay with the high lord until the end and that's like another one like he's reminding her stay with the high lord and then she asks his name and he says does it matter we never fucking his name okay and then so it asks they were to leave this world a better place than how you found it because it was a dreamer me. gets me every time okay so then Helian finds her and winnows her back and then people are like mad that she just like went off to find the cereal in the middle of battle so then Elaine gets taken by the cauldron and Nesta scries to find okay so Nesta scries to find where the cauldron is and the cauldron senses them there um, and Nessa like gets too close to it and then in retaliation the cauldron takes a lane. So then Azriel is like, I'm getting her back. <sighs> okay. And then Nessa's like, you'll die. And he's like, I'm getting her back. And then Farah's like, I'll go with you. So they both go and one thing I noticed is that Reese said, you do not falter, you do not yield. You go in and you get her and you come out. And you do not yield is a quote from Throne of Glass. And that was definitely on purpose. Okay, so they go into the Highburn camp and they see Jury in there. And there's this like human that they're torturing. And she's like, I need to get the human and Elaine out. And they work with Jury in to do that. And then basically like they're, they get Elaine, but it, they're hunting them down. Like they're going to get caught. And Tamlin like out himself as a double spy to save Feyre and gives her this wind so that she can take off to fly um and that's like her first time like flying like that and it's just like oof. okay and then this one line I found very interesting it says I didn't have the nerd to request she finds some of Amarin's preferred food as well even though I had no doubt Amarin would need it after her activities with Varen last night unless he'd and I'm like did she just imply that Amarin is a vampire and like drank his blood okay and then more and Feyre have a heart to heart and more confesses to Feyre that she like can't love Azrael like that because she prefers females um and that's like sh because of the way that she was raised she's had to like hide her sexuality and she like can't come to terms with it essentially um so she still like sleeps with males to throw Azrael off the the truth basically so that's a whole whole other thing that needs to be um unwound and i'm sure there will be future books that deal with that so then amaran says she found a way to stop the entire army with the book and everyone that was made can can do it okay so then 
Feyre is like, okay, we're gonna need the, the mirror. So she winnows to the Ouroboros and she has to face what's inside, which is the beast within herself. And then the bone carver. So now here we are and it's the day of the final battle and Azriel gives Elaine truth teller, which he's never let anyone touch in all of his years of life. Okay. Anyways, and they have their last little talk together and it's like emo and then uh, there's so many connections with Cassie and Nesta. Um, and then Feyre shows Reese that she made a bargain with the Bone Carver. So Braxis and Bone Carver are there, and then Striga, the Weaver in the Woods, is also there because Reese made a bargain with her. So then they're all fighting, blah blah blah. But then, so then the other armies come to help, which is Baron, the humans, and the Spring Court. So that was good. And then all of a sudden, Nesta feels the cauldron gathering power and she screams, Cassian, 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 and Cassian comes flying to her and basically the cauldron like annihilated where Cassian was. So she saved. Okay, and then the, the cauldron killed the bone carver. So let's see what's next. Then the seraphim show up and Draken's legion and then we find out that their dad came sailing back he was the prince of merchants. He made a deal to get Vasa to come and help them, and he named the ships the Feyre, the Elaine, and the Nesta at the helm. He very emotional when I read that. I was like, oh. Even though like the father's character was like not really built up at all up until this point, like it still it still gets me. So then Feyre and Amran run for the cauldron, and they get to the cauldron, and Amran basically had lied, and she like throws the book aside, and Feyre is like the conduit on the cauldron and like through the cauldron she goes and like basically sees what's happening as Nessa is calling the cauldron's power to her and Nessa tries to kill the king but the king has their father and then like snaps his neck and so Nessa loses her grip on the pow on the power for a second and then ne Cassian tries to kill the king um, and then the king starts beating him up and then Nessa has power and so she like explodes it at the king and the king is back but then he knows that he's gonna get them and then then Cassian and Nesta pretty much think that they're gonna die. And Cassian is like, I regret that I didn't have more time with you. I'll find you in the next life. Ugh, my heart. And then Nesta decides to stay with him and they wake up. But then Elaine comes. And I don't know how she got there. I'm assuming because she's connected to the cauldron. And stabs the king through the neck and says, don't touch my sister. <sighs> okay, okay, that was just like a big emotional thing that happened and then Nesta comes and she like twists the knife in and actually takes his head off. Iconic. And then basically we find out that Emery wants to be like unbound and so Feyre unbinds her and then she becomes this like thing of wings and fire and all of that. And she like just wipes out everyone on the, f the battlefield essentially um, and then she's gone. And then the battle is over. However, the cauldron was destroyed. So Feyre is like, oh my god, like I need to make it. So then she uses Reese as an anchor and they use their power to, to make the cauldron over. And then Reese says a final, I love you. And then he dies because he gave all of his power. And it's just like, literally, oh my god, this book is just like insane. Like the last 100 pages were insane. And then so Feyre is like screaming and she's like, oh my god. Surreal said stay with the High Lord. So she like holds onto the scraps in the mating bond. And then she screams at the other High Lords to bring him back and give them the scraps of her, his power. And then the last one that they need is Tamlin. And she's like, I'll give anything. And then he says, be happy, Feyre. And you know what? He still sucks. It doesn't make up for anything that he's done, but good on him, I guess. And then so Reese comes back to life. And he makes jokes and he's like, I didn't get any of your powers, so don't worry. And then Amran's in the cauldron, and, but she doesn't have her powers anymore. She's just regular high five. Okay, so then this is where I found a lot of foreshadowing to future events. So I'm going to see what happens. So like Cassian is standing. So Pharaoh wonders like, did Nessa actually like heal him in those moments? Or was it just his strength? But like, so that could potentially mean like Nesta has more than just death powers. Maybe she has like death and life powers because the cauldron is also life. Um, let's see. 
and then they bury the father, which is very sad. Okay, and then Lucien comes up and describes that Vasa, and he says the human queens are still out there, not for long if Vasa has anything to do with it. So I think there's going to be like an Elaine, Vasa, Lucien type of thing going on, because Lucien seems to have a little crushy crush on Vasa. And then we meet Mar Miriam and Dracon, which I'd love to learn more about them. And then, like, Tamlin sees Lucien wearing the Illyrian leathers, and he's just like, it doesn't speak to him. And so there's like a conversation for another day. So I think that will happen in a future book. Okay. So then Vasa says that she like can find a loophole for her to stay longer. Um, and that they will also discuss like the threat of the fellow queen. So I definitely think that's going to come back again later in a later book. Who knows, maybe even the next book. Um, and then Nessa's just like, bereft after the end of all of this and Favor wonders like if the cauldron had broke like maybe that broke something in Nesta as well since they are so like connected since Nesta took whereas it doesn't seem to affect Lane the same way maybe because she was freely given that power like the cauldron let go of that power that would be my reasoning why it would be different okay and then Elaine said she was like to build a garden because the world needs more gardens and then she had this like ending scene between Reese and Feyre where he's like, I heard you when I was gone. And then they make a bargain that when it's time to die, they die together. And then she gets her other, like her left arm is tatted again and Reese's arm is tatted and they have magic tattoos. And that's the end. And like, I'm just like emotionally drained after all of that because that was insane and intense. And I'm so, so excited for what's come next in the series. Rereading the series has honestly been so much fun. I feel like I even got more out of it the second read around. And it's been really fun to do these live shows and these vlogs as well, because I've gotten to talk about my feelings really in depth. So it's been really fun. So stick around for my A Court of Frost and Starlight vlog, which will definitely not be as long because that book is short and a bit of a filler piece, but still fun. And I will be doing a vlog for a court of silver flames as well because i'm so excited to see what happens with nesta and cassian and see what happens during that 700 pages i've heard that it's supposed to get steamier like please we've been waiting for it i mean this series has been basically rebranded as adult so i can't wait um yeah thanks so much for watching let me know your thoughts on the series on this book below in the comments and have some fun reads and books and i'll catch you guys in the next one <laughs>